Hey everybody, this is Erica, the technology nerd who likes to film stuff, and it's time for the first impressions of the Nexus 7 II? Nexus 7 2013? Okay, Nexus 7, the second edition. So the format of this video is kind of going to be like a review, but not an incredibly in-depth review. I'm going to be picking out a couple of things to talk about, such as measuring the display. Google has really been bragging about the display quality over the first one, which really wasn't so nice and it was really lacking in green. So I took some measurements and I was able to see just how good the display was, so I'm going to be discussing that. Also, I want to talk about 4.3 Jelly Bean and a little bit of the changes and if it really does feel like there's much of a change, which I can say honestly right now, no. I also want to talk about them stereo speakers. I have the HTC One and the Boom Sound stereo speakers are just fantastic. So I want to talk a little bit about what I'm seeing with the speakers on this guy here and how they really add up. And then of course I want to talk about the processors that are in this guy here. Now Google says that it is the S4 Pro processor, but actually it looks like it's a bit of a beefed up S4 Pro. It's not quite like the Nexus 4. You're getting a little bit better performance. So let's go and see how this guy performs. Now before getting into the main four points that I want to talk about, let's look at the size of both of these. Now in my unboxing video I had noticed that the 2013 edition of the Nexus 7 is quite a bit thinner. It's got to be several millimeters thinner. It's also a bit lighter in hand and also I am just loving the form factor of this. I've got the tiniest little hands possible and people say, oh your fingers are so fat. No, actually my hands are just really really small. For example, here is the Galaxy S4 in my hand. It looks like a teeny tiny thing in some people's hands but yeah, and so no, they're just small. So the change in width is quite a bit of a bonus. I would think that a lot of parents would probably get this tablet for their kids since it is quite a good price. Starting at $230, that really is a steal. So for people who have teeny little hands like myself, this tablet is really quite awesome. And also since they changed the width on this, it makes it so much easier for me to be able to type on this thing. I love now using this in Google Chat or Hangout as I have no trouble holding it and typing on this thing. So it's, it's just become really a pleasure. On this one, it was quite a bit thicker and more cumbersome and more heavy, and it just was harder for me to type. So I really love the size of this. They did a very good job here. I also really like the soft touch feel that's on this one versus what we had on the guy from before. I didn't really like the texture of this. It's a little bit sticky feeling. So they've really made this feel a lot more premium, and I'm surprised with the build quality as well. This is a cheap little device, but it is well constructed. There is no bending or creaking. It is very, very solid. There was something about the first edition that just felt kind of cheap. It does creak quite a bit. This one really does feel quite cheap. But now on this one, I, I just love that soft touch. I think they've done a really great job with the form factor. It's very solid, no creaking. It's, it's really good for the price, and I would recommend it for anybody. Now, even though this device is taller, this is really just a bit of bezel that has been added that makes it a lot easier to hold it when reading content or when browsing the web in portrait view. The aspect ratios and the size of the displays are exactly the same size. It's just that the pixel density on this one is so much nicer, and that's what we're going to start with is talking about the display. Starting with the resolution, this is 1920 by 1200, with a pixel density of 323 pixels per inch, which is just three pixels shy of the iPhone 5, which is 326 pixels per inch. So as I had mentioned in my unboxing, this really looks a lot like the Retina display on the iPhone 5. Text is really crisp and sharp. Browsing the web has been a very good experience. Now this is an IPS display and I'm noticing that the viewing angles are quite great and I'm not noticing any color shifts really, if any at all. Also, since this display gets really nice and bright, it is brilliant for direct sunlight. So if you're someone who likes to read outdoors, you're not going to have any trouble with being able to see this guy in direct sunlight. Next thing to do, of course, is to nerd out and go and check out some measurements that I have made. With a colorimeter, I'm able to plug it into the USB port on my computer, and I'm able to measure the display to see the things from gamut to whether there's color shifts to see how well it's calibrated. And for the most part, I'm pleased. I'm going to show you what I found. Okay, now to look at some findings. In front of us is my laptop because I didn't feel like importing images and getting out my Yeti Blue Mic and doing voiceovers. So the first thing that I like about this display is that the contrast ratio is pretty decent. So 
here we have the number here, one, which represents your white, and then you've got 1,182, which represents the ratio between black to white. Generally, the higher this number, the better looking blacks that you're gonna get. So if you think about an AMOLED panel, blacks are really punchy and very dark on that, so this number will be very, very, very big. But anything above a thousand is pretty good for an LCD screen, and it just means that blacks or, you know, shadows will look pretty decent. The next thing that I like about this display is the color temperature. I like that the whites are closer to neutral. This line here, 6,500K, is your neutral line. It just means that your whites are right in the middle, they're not too warm, and they're not too cold looking. So you can see that the white color temperatures are not too far above neutral. A lot of the LCD displays that I've seen lately are somewhere around 7,500K, 8,000K or even above. At that point, displays just look way too blue. At that point, whites just don't look good. The display just doesn't look so good. So the temperature is not bad at all, and I applaud Google for that. Now, checking out Gamut here, Google says that the 2013 edition of the Nexus 7 has about 30% more gamut than the one before it. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, the thing with the first edition of the Nexus 7 is that it just didn't have enough green. So that means that green would have been sitting somewhere around here. What this triangle represents is actually your gamut. And for displays, ideally you will have at least sRGB gamut, which just means that this whole triangle will be evenly filled. So the good thing is that it's pretty close to sRGB. The closer to sRGB gamut, the more natural the display is going to look in color. The downfall of this display is that it's missing a little bit of red. You can see that it doesn't go all the way to this line here. That just means that there's just not enough red. Reds won't look as punchy as they're supposed to. Although honestly, it's not terrible. And then you can see that the gamut exceeds the triangle, which is not a bad thing at all. It just means it has a wider gamut in this area. But what I'm seeing is that the green is just a little bit towards the yellow side. So greens are just ever so slightly yellow. But other than this, colors look pretty decent. Colors will start looking really weird if they're not in a straight line. So if green kind of had one over here, one over here, one over here, then it would mean that as the saturation is increasing that the color is just not the same. So colors really are not that bad. It is lacking in red and green is just a tad bit yellow, but I actually like the colors of this display. But this display has one major downfall and that would be that the shadows don't look too nice. So look at this chart. This is our gamma chart here. We have highlights, midtones, and shadows. Now think white and black. For a display to look its best, it should be somewhere around gamma 2.2. If it starts going too high above gamma 2.2, it means that the gamma is too high and things start looking too dark. If it goes too far below gamma 2.2, it means that the gamma is too low and things start looking just too bright. So imagine you have shadows here. Things are supposed to look dark, right? Things are supposed to look black or very dark gray. But instead, the shadows are too bright, which means if you are someone who likes to watch a lot of dark movies, things just don't look right anymore. Shadows don't look like shadows. They look like some type of variation of gray. And for me and a lot of other people, that will just ruin the dark movie or dark scene experience. The good thing is that this looks like it's processing and if somebody can make a custom kernel that goes and finds what Google did and just disables this nonsense, we should go back to having a pretty darn good display. It's funny because they're doing this also in highlights or in whites, but it's a lot less noticeable there. Maybe clouds won't look pitch perfect, but I'm not so concerned about this. This is nonsense. This is a big no-no, Google. Fix it. This is a closer look. It should be following this line nicely downward, going in a gradient. Gray, 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 dark gray, dark gray, dark gray, black suddenly. No, instead it just goes, oh, I'm going to be too bright, too bright, too bright, too bright and you're just gonna ruin your movie experience. Haha, <laughs> too bad for you. But I'm hopeful that someone will fix this, and overall, this is a really nice display. When I found out that this tablet had stereo speakers, I was incredibly excited, especially when comparing to the original, which didn't really have all that nice sounding speakers, and it's just right here at the bottom. Google has worked with Fraunhofer in order to integrate their Singo software. It's just software for the surround sound, which means that in the future they're able to take this Singo software and put it on any device. But right now, this is the device that has Singo integrated into it, and basically it just makes a simulated type of surround sound, and so far I found it to be quite nice. So if you go onto Google Play and you download a video that has 5.1 surround sound capabilities, then you can hear that the software is actually trying to simulate the surround sound in some way. It creates a really neat kind of effect. 
If you have a chance to play with the Nexus 7 or if you've already bought one, you can go onto Google's website and they have a surround sound demo called Debbie, or you can also find it on YouTube. I think the one on YouTube streams a little bit better. So as far as stereo speakers go, these sound pretty nice. Fraunhofer did not design these speakers at all. The hardware did not come from Fraunhofer, only the Singo sound. But for being such a cheap tablet, most things sound actually pretty darn good. I noticed that with the music, there isn't a lot of distortion. The one complaint that I do have though, is that when it hits certain frequencies, such as really high frequencies, or even if you're on Netflix listening to your favorite show where there's a lot of voices, there's a lot of speaking voice frequencies, I've noticed that it starts to hit a buzz. It buzzes a little bit. I think that's because it's hitting its resonance frequency. And that's when you can see the limitation of the cheap speakers. Now, when you're hitting higher frequencies, the thing that you need to do is just turn down the volume and it seems to get rid of the buzz. But for speaking voices, just say I'm watching something like Law & Order SVU on Netflix. I've noticed that when a person is getting close and they're just talking, normal talking, that you do get that bit of buzz. Now, this is something that I implore people to go and to check out. And if you have one already, tell me if you're noticing the same thing. This is something that I am seeing a lot with speaking voices, with speaking, not yelling, not screaming, just speaking at a normal loudness. I've noticed that if I turn down the volume quite a bit, the buzzing gets a little bit better, but that's usually when I'm already below 50%. So when comparing these surround sound stereo speakers with something like the HTC One Boom Sound, I have to say that, yeah, still definitely the HTC One wins. When watching content on the HTC One, I'm definitely not hearing any buzz. But when you're not experiencing the buzz, the speakers, like I mentioned, are pretty good. They sound very full. I am able to hear a lot of bass in there. And I don't think that it's incapable of reproducing a lot of frequencies. I just think that they start to resonate and you start getting that buzz. Lastly, for the speakers, I really wish that they were on the front like the Nexus 10 because it's very easy when you're holding the tablet to obstruct those speakers and they become actually quite muffled. So I end up having to hold it from the bottom or I end up having to compensate. And to make sure that my palm is not cupping the speakers that are on the bottom. So that's a little bit frustrating that they're on the bottom that way. But in terms of the price and the jump up that we have from the original Nexus 7, you really have nothing to complain about. The next thing that people are asking me is, should I get this even though I have a Nexus 4? Isn't it just like the Nexus 4? Well, actually there's a few changes here. The Nexus 4 was a pretty good phone, but one thing that I had noticed with the Nexus 4 is that when you were playing games, there was some GPU throttling. That was incredibly annoying because once the phone had gotten to like 39 degrees Celsius, it really started throttling to about half the frequency it was able to meet. So when you were playing games, you started seeing a lot of stuttering in those games. That was completely awful. So that is not the issue anymore with this. There is no throttling during gameplay. Now, even though they're no longer throttling for the GPU, there is still some CPU throttling, but the thresholds are a lot higher. Now on the Nexus 4, the thresholds were only 39 degrees Celsius. 39 degrees Celsius is nothing and it's very easy to reach. Now, if you look what we have here, this is 1.5 gigahertz and it looks like it's starting to throttle at 90 degrees Celsius. So you can see that the threshold from 39 degrees Celsius to 90 degrees Celsius is a lot different. Also, even though this device is called an S4 Pro, it is not just like the Nexus 4. Actually, like I mentioned in the beginning of the video, I want to call it a more beefed up version of the S4 Pro or a new S4 Pro. So the Nexus 4 has LPDDR2 RAM and it also has four Crate 200 cores where this guy actually has DDR3L RAM and it has four Crate 300 cores. So it looks a lot more like the S600s that we have out now. The clock is at one point five gigahertz where the clocks on the S 600s are 1.7 gigahertz. So Google has a reason for calling it an S four pro. So let's just call it a beefed up version, but Hey, it actually puts it quite on par with a lot of other devices out there and benchmarks. It does so much better than the original Nexus seven. And in gaming, I've noticed that the gameplay is incredibly smooth. The one thing that I have to say that it just really bothers me about the S 600s that I'm seeing out, whether it's from the HTC one or even the galaxy S four is that that during some games like Granny Smith, I'm seeing stuttering. I know Granny Smith isn't one of those things that you'd typically want to use for benchmarks, but it was showing me quite a bit of a difference as it's one of my favorite games. When I play Granny Smith, 
on this device, Google has done something where it just plays so smoothly. I'm not having any jittering or jumpiness or pausing. So for gameplay, I have found this to be really a great device. It's got Adreno 320, but for some reason, it's doing better than either of these two. I'm just noticing a perfectly smooth gameplay experience on this device, and it's just fantastic. Now, as far as overall CPU performance of this device, it is a very snappy, quick little device. Clocked at 1.5 gigahertz, I'm not seeing any lags or jank or anything like that. It's really a pleasant experience. I'm sure that a lot of you are going to say, hey, it looks like the S600, why not make it act like an S600 and you're going to overclock it to 1.7 gigahertz? Why not? Tell me how that goes. If it's stable, that's, that's excellent. But at 1.5 gigahertz, it's really no slouch. This is a really nice device. Now getting into Jelly Bean 4.3, I am sure we have that to thank in part for just how smooth this device is. But Jelly Bean 4.3 also offers a couple of really awesome features such as OpenGL 3 support. So just say that you're an application developer and you want to make a really advanced looking 3D game with a lot of detail and really awesome graphics. Your game taking advantage of OpenGL 3 will work on the Nexus 7. So that is something that I am very excited to see in the near future, seeing some very detailed games coming out. Another really cool feature of Jelly Bean 4.3 is that Bluetooth is now able to connect to a bunch of different peripheral devices seamlessly and they're able to talk back and forth. They are calling devices that are able to do this Bluetooth Smart Ready Hubs and any peripheral device such as a scale or some type of a medical device, just say for people who have diabetes, heart rate monitors, fitness tracking devices, all of those things are going to be able to seamlessly communicate back and forth now with your Nexus 7 device, so I find that to be pretty cool. Now under Wi-Fi settings, we have something new that's actually quite handy and should help to save battery life. Go underneath your advanced tab and you can see here it says scanning always available. It says let Google's location service and other apps scan for networks even when Wi-Fi is off. Wi-Fi is used a lot of time for triangulation to help you find out quickly where you're located, especially in things like Google Maps. Other applications use this as well and will constantly be getting data from that. The thing is that before you always had to have Wi-Fi on in order for Android to be able to do that, but that is no more. So this is all in an effort to save battery life. It can continue scanning and doing its triangulation with Wi-Fi even when Wi-Fi is off. Now everybody knows there's those applications that just drive you nuts and you're able to disable them. But the thing is that there never was an actual tab. You'd actually have to go through all your applications and then eventually at the bottom you'd see all the disabled ones. Well, now they finally have a disabled tab. And lastly, the biggest and most obvious change in Jelly Bean 4.3 is restricted profiles. So this here is just my normal profile. I have access to everything. You can see all my applications are here. I have access to Google Play Store. Everything is accessible. Now I created a profile. Just say that if I was to turn off the tablet for just a second, Turn it back on, and if you go down to the bottom, you can see that you can very easily select between different profiles. I created one that's called For the Kids. Once you open it up, you can go and look under Applications, and it's very sparse under here. There's only a couple things that they can get into. You can see that the Play Store still sits here, but when you click on it, it says you don't have permission to use Google Play Store, so that's great. If you want to create a restricted profile or lock down some applications so that they can't be used, you need to be inside of the owner profile. Right now I'm in you or for the kids and you can see it says only the tablet's owner can manage users. So now that I'm logged back into the owner account, I can go ahead and add a profile. You can create just a user account which is allowed to install their own applications and have all their own content or you can have a restricted profile which essentially just takes your own user account and turns some things off. So go ahead and you can see that it gives us a list here. Settings is one thing that looks like it's always available. And then you can go through and just enable what you want to be on there. So I really like this. Google has made tablets now kind of like a personal computer where everyone can have their own private profile. You can keep everyone out of your stuff. If you want to hand your tablet over to somebody, you can have just a visitor profile so that all your private pictures or whatever doesn't have to be looked at. Android is nice, quick, snappy, lots of features. It's really coming along. So thank you everybody for watching. This has been Erica, the technology nerd who likes to film stuff. Please rate, comment, and subscribe. 
this tablet is just so much better. This isn't a full in-depth review. This is more or less kind of like a first impressions video. So there's some things that I did not cover, but hopefully with what I showed you, you can decide if this is the tablet for you. I recommend this tablet for everybody. The price point and just the quality of it is just awesome. I don't think that you will regret buying this with the price point. I just can't see that being possible. So if you want a small tablet with decent specs at a good price range, go get this guy, seriously.